So thanks for that. I'm Andrew Grill from Cred, and what we do in a sentence is we measure online influence. And online influence is a very, very um, controversial topic at the moment because essentially we're assigning a score to every one of you in the room. Now, why it's controversial is because people are saying, how can you really measure influence using a machine? Because I know who I am. And there's a lot of myopic discussion at the moment about these scores, whether it be a Cred score or the other metrics. And even now, some people are putting them on their CVs. I think just relying on one number and one score is about as silly as putting your salary on your head. So out the foyer, just before we all had coffee, imagine if we'd written our salary on our heads and decided that the most important person in the room was the person with the highest number on their head. Now maybe because they paid more, they have more responsibility, maybe they run a department or run a company, but if you're looking for someone that is actually influential in a specific topic or area or location, that one number of someone's salary is actually meaningless. So what I would love you just to take away one thing from what I talk about today is don't just trust a score as a measure of being influential. Because these systems can be gained. You can gain cred. The difference with our system is that we've had access to the Twitter firehose since 2008. So we've been collecting through a commercial and technical relationship with Twitter every single tweet since November 2008. So we have 100 billion tweets in our database. When you realize what we've got to work with in terms of raw materials, that means we can start to look at the relationships and the correlations between people and what they talk about and where they talk about it. So what I want for Christmas and what you should want for Christmas is to be able to find influences that are relevant to your business. The reason why is that I think we're growing tired of the celebrity endorsement. Everyone knows that if a celebrity is given a car or a handbag or something like that, they're probably being paid to promote it. The chances are that they probably aren't absolutely passionate about the product because if you're given it for free and you're given lots of stuff for free, are you really passionate and knowledgeable about the topic? Then we come to the bloggers that are actually paid bloggers. Um, one of my clients actually pays some um, bloggers in the order of £5,000 a month to be nice to them and write nice stuff about them. And I was in Athens, I wasn't in Athens, I was in Milan last week talking to Unicredit, a large bank. And they're saying that in some markets, um, bloggers are saying basically I'm working with this organisation and unless you pay me more I won't talk about you. So what my clients are saying and what you should be saying is how do we find the normal people? How do we find the unpaid bloggers? that are really passionate about a topic, that are happy to promote your product or service because they actually like it and use it. So, how do you actually do that? I'm Australian, so I like to break things down to bare principles. And I think social media is just like real life. And we've had an example of that this morning. You all got here and had coffee in the coffee area, and I gather most of you did not know each other. So what did you do? I'll tell you what I did. I overheard a conversation from Diane, who's in the room, so I'm like, Diane, where are you? There you are. She mentioned the word Australian. She'd lived in Australia. So when I walked over to her, you want to, I'm not loud enough? So when I walked over to Diane, I started the conversation with saying, I'm Australian, whereabouts in Australia did you live? And that opened the dialogue, and we had a lovely conversation about not just business, but also about cities in Australia. My point is, if I'd gone up to Diane and said, I work at Cred and you should use us because we're fantastic, she would have walked the other way. In fact, I deliberately didn't tell her what I did till the very end, and we didn't talk about me until the very end. Now, the challenge is that we all know how to interact in real life. We all know how to follow and unfollow conversations. The challenge is we get back to work, and we're programmed to broadcast, and we're programmed to market. And if I had a pound for anyone that said, how do we advertise on social media, this brand new channel, how do we get this message out there, I wouldn't be standing here today. So when you think back to how social media can be used in a marketing and advertising context, think back to the coffee conversation. Think back to those discussions you had this morning where you met someone for the very first time and how you engage with them. And if you're a brand, you've got to be equally relevant. So to start the discussion with Diana, I had to have something relevant to say. And it's fairly easy for humans to do that. It's much harder for a brand to say, hi, I'm brand X and you need to know me and you need to like me and you need to follow me because I'm fantastic. I don't think we'll break away from that very soon because we're programmed to broadcast a market. So I think social media is just a bit like real life. If we treat it the same way, it's hard, but it will actually pay off. 
And the thing is, you can't buy space in that conversation. The conversation Diane had this morning was not for sale. There was no space I could buy. I couldn't bid for it. And so the challenge in social media is how do you get your message out there without appearing like you're a big, bad corporate trying to push a marketing message down my throat? I don't read ads anymore. I don't believe ads anymore because I'm a marketer. I know how the process works. I want you to buy my product. I tell you how wonderful it is. I don't tell you about the bad stuff. And hopefully you'll buy it. How do I shop these days? I ask my network. So if I'm going to buy a product that has a pain point, insurance, mobile phone contract, bank loan, I'll ask someone else that's gone through that pain. Because I'll probably believe them. Now, Diane and I were talking about charities. If I needed to know which charity I should donate to, I'm probably going to contact her. I've met her once. We've established a relationship. And I trust her because I've met her. Yet I'm not going to believe someone on the street who says, uh, a couple of seconds of your time. Because I know they're being paid. And there's a whole story about that. So it's about finding these influences that can spread your message and do it authentically. There's a guy called Dave Black who sums up social media in a couple of paragraphs. And I just thought I'd share them with you because it's really, really succinct. Marketing sets the expectation, marketing creates demand, and marketing helps the consumer differentiate why one choice is better than the other. Pretty obvious stuff. But operations delivers. And any gap between the two is where you'll drive a conversation. Now, that's more relevant in the service provider say, space. If I'm a utility company or a mobile phone company, I will make mistakes. And a couple of nights ago, I heard Warren Buckley from BT talk. He runs essentially BT Care. So if you tweet BT at BT Care, one of his 25 staff in Northern Ireland will take your complaint on Twitter and deal with it. And there's a whole discussion we can have about how they're doing things quite well on social media. But the reason that there is a discussion is I'm angry with brand X. The thing also is what actually is the point where I take my mobile out of my hand and I want to tweet a good or a bad thing about a brand? There's got to be that threshold. Because I'm just having a great day, I'm not going to tweet I'm having a great day. But if I'm in Waitrose, and once again, the Waitrose partner walks me halfway around the store to find the thing I can't find that my wife sent me in there to buy, I'm really happy to tweet, once again, at Waitrose has you know, shown exceptional customer service. I want my network to hear I'm having a good experience. Just as if Vodafone decide to put their prices up across the board by one pound for all the business plans like they did this week, I'll tweet I'm upset about it. So sometimes it's actually good to have the fact that someone's tweeted about you. It means they care. Bringing influences into the play, I think the new social advertising is actually peer advocacy. It's about me recommending something. It's about someone saying on Twitter or Facebook, what's the best X for this? And so I then say, I recommend this because I really believe in that. The challenge is, am I a paid endorser? Have I been paid hundreds of thousands of pounds to say that? Would I really believe and I use that product so I like it? The consumer decision journey is changing. This is actually from three years ago from McKinsey. This is the obvious stuff, the funnel awareness, familiarity, consideration, purchase loyalty, all marketing 101 stuff. Social is massively disrupting that chain. You've now got the consideration and evaluation set, which is being impacted by social because I'm doing my research on social, asking people what they think. And then what McKinsey says, and remember this is three years old, but it's relevant today as back then. I'm then going to this loyalty loop where I'm just staying because I'm really happy with what I'm actually using. And if someone else says, what do you think of Vodafone, I'll tell them. The hospitality industry is probably the best example of people getting social right. Because for 100 years, they've been programmed to say it's not a problem. We all have a story of going to a hotel, something going wrong and them fixing it. My best story ever is pre-Twitter. Back in about 2004, my wife and I were staying at the Canberra um, uh, Ridges, I think, Canberra Height in Canberra. I won't tell you what went wrong because it's just too hard to explain. I will tell you they upgraded us to the presidential suite. It took us half an hour to go through the 17 rooms and grand piano and taking photographs of each other in the presidential suite. They completely took the problem away and have had Twitter had existed back then, it would have been plastered with photographs of us in the presidential suite. Here's an example of a friend of mine, Stephen Bynum, who was staying in the Dillon Hotel in Ireland, in Dublin. For whatever reason, his hot water was not working and he tweeted that it wasn't working. He didn't go to the front desk. I don't know why. He tweeted, you can see the, the bottom tweet, no hot water in the Dillon Hotel this morning, can you believe it? 
got back to his room and there was a letter waiting for him. Thank you for your tweet. We're fixing it. The moral of the story is that letter is still there and visible. He told the world the Dillon Hotel fixes problems. And so if I'm going to Dublin, guess where I'm going to stay? The Dillon Hotel. My own personal experience, I love this one. Uh, about 12 months ago, was flying from Seattle to San Francisco. First time ever in San Francisco, staying at the wonderful Mark Hopkins Intercontinental. I was actually there on a cheap rate because a friend of mine from social media was the head of social for Intercontinental. So I was already there on a cheap rate. So I tweeted, first time in San Francisco, can you give me a room that shows off your wonderful city? Very, very cheeky. Didn't know what to expect. Tweet back from the hotel, we'll see what we can do. You'll love it here. Guess what happened when I checked in on Friday night? Mr. Grill, thank you so much for your tweet. We've upgraded you to a suite. And we'll give you free internet for the weekend so you can tweet about your stay there. So what did I do as an influencer? I realised that one good turn or one good tweet deserves another. So I blogged about my experience. My blog post is now used by the Intercontin Intercontinental Hotels Group globally as a case study on what happens when you treat customers right. I was there three weeks ago as part of a Cred Leaders Conference. I wanted to go to their bar called the Mark Hopkins Top of the Mark. It's normally full. I tweeted to them, I'm in town, can you get me space for three people? It, they made it happen. Because they know that I have some cred in the industry and if I'm talking about the hotel, I'm even talking about them here in London. So how do we find the influences? This is the guts of it. Um, obviously I'm going to talk about why you would use cred. Cred.com is fairly new to the market, we're the third player. The fact we've got this amazing access to tweets though means that we can do quite an amazing job. And you'll see there, covered in the Christmas hat, is my cred score. I'm 885 over 8. We have two scores because we think it's not just about influence, it's also about outreach. So my 885 is quite a good score, it's out of 1,000, that's a reasonably good score. The 8 actually is more important to me. The 8, and you can see more on everyone's individual page, shows my outreach, how many people I'm following, how many times I retweet. This actually shows, is this person likely to promote my brand authentically? And we've actually proved this. This is great in theory. One of our clients is using this to find influencers in the motorsport industry in London because they want to give people access to tickets to a motor racing event. What they found is that when we found influencers in that space, the higher the outreach number, the more likely they were to say, yes, I'd love to come along for a free ticket to Brands Hatch and talk about the brand. A lower influence outreach score, they were less likely. So we can actually start saying, is this person likely to talk about the brand? Where we're different also from other metrics is we show everything completely transparently. Every single tweet, you can see how many points you earn and did your score go up. Why is that important? If someone is gaming the system, you can see it's being gamed and you can then dis discount them. And finally, what we're doing to sort of promote this further is we're allowing brands, that would be people in the room, to match their product with influencers. And so for example, Soul Republic there, one of our partners, they want to give away some amazing headphones. They're worth two or three hundred dollars each. They don't want to go to just anyone who's got the highest score. They want to find people that are authentically loving sound, are likely to use and you know, talk about the headphones, and are in specific locations as well. So that's me. Um, I'm also on this thing called Twitter, Andrew Grill, and um, thanks for your attention today. Thank you, Andrew. Um, <laughs> any questions out there? Can I ask you one? Um, I've got a clout score, which I have to say is a bit of a mystery to me. Yes. Um, it seems to go up and down like a fiddler's elbow, and I can't work out what the mechanics are behind it. Anybody else out there use clout at all? Um, uh, yeah? Good. Andrew, is it the obvious competitor? So I can't speak for cloud as to how their algorithm works. In fact, they don't tell you how the algorithm works. Okay. Um, we do. We actually, on our rules page, we explain exactly how it works and how all the points are. So my answer to that would be, unless you can see inside the black box, you're not quite sure what you're looking at. So whatever metric you use, you should be able to understand how it works. So if the score does go up and down, you should understand why. Yeah. And is that uh, a problem? But more importantly, don't just look at your global K score. Look at the score in a specific community. Because if I'm trying to market to you in the home business community, it might be that your cred score on that is very, very low, which means you're not actually useful to me in that area, even though your global score is very high. Because it's about relevance. 
Where do you have influence, not just how big it is? It's back to putting your salary on your head, but not telling people that you actually work uh, driving a forklift. Not that there's anything wrong with driving forklifts, but wearing a suit, you may not think that you do. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. Um, Sam over there, who um, is part of the Greenlight Social team, um, is microphone-less, so if, I, if you don't mind, Sam, I'll uh, ask it on your behalf. Um, what you've just said suggests that influence starts with a topic rather than with an individual. Is, is that how the process works in terms of uh, setting up cred to help you uh, understand who matters in a particular market on a particular topic? Last time I looked, human beings form communities, not topics. So we start from the community. So we have about 200 communities, people that like cycling or sailing or their doctors, and we start looking down in the community to see who are the people within that community and who do I influence and who is influenced by that. So you won't see us having topics around uh, bubble gum or IKEA. You'll have us with topics that matter. Also, we can create a community. So if you come to me saying, I'm looking for people that like music in London that also travel a lot, I could create a London music travelers community and then look within there to see who's influential. So it actually starts with knowing who matters in terms of a group or community, and then on the top of that, looking to see within that community who's influential. Okay, all right. Um, just one more corollary to that then. Um, this is a real one for an investment bank. Um, once upon a time, I was asked to identify who the experts were in the UK on jet engine technology for narrow-bodied aircraft. I presume that you haven't set up a community for Not, and that's such a really, folks. And that's a really niche one. They were probably be easier to find <coughs> because it's quite niche and quite narrow. Yeah. The challenge is, and I'll you know, be honest here, we may not be able to find any of them because we're looking on social networks. The challenge is how do you actually look at offline influence? We also are trying that. We have offline influence as well. But if they're not actually very visible, the challenge for all of us is how do you become found? Sure. Having said that, I'm sure we could actually put a few tweets out to say, who knows about, what was it, narrow-bodied aircraft engineers in London? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not perfect. Thank you. Okay, go on, Sam. Um, do you require my uh, permission as a Twitter user to archive and store my content so you can work out who's an influencer, or do you just find it and then report on that? So everyone on Craig starts with a... If you're on Twitter and your profile is open, we only collect public tweets. We have the relationship with Twitter, so we also have to abide by their terms and conditions. So if you delete a tweet, we don't have it either. So to answer your question, it's an opt-out where we have 120 million profiles. We are very, very interested and adherent to privacy. So if you don't want to be on cred, you can opt out on three different levels. You can say, I'd like to be slightly anonymous, I'd like to be totally anonymous, or as some users have said, I want to be off altogether and we will respect that. But we start from the um, premise that the tweet is public, uh, and us and others, Sysimos and, and Brandwatch also, have access to this data. The challenge is consumers don't know this. They don't know that we're calculating these scores about them. So we have to be very, very sensitive. And I think we're in a really privileged position. The fact I've assigned each one of you in this room a score is a pretty formidable thing because I'm saying that one person has more numbers than the other. So we are absolutely uh, adherent to all the privacy laws, but yes, all of these systems start from the fact that if it's public, uh, we're allowed to collect it through the terms and conditions with Twitter. But if you don't want to, we'll turn you off and we'll respect that. Thanks, Andrew.